It's, it's great to finally be able to talk to Roger in person up on the stage. I have read Roger's book, and I said to Roger, it was one of the best books I've, written, I've read around this issue of technology platforms, very thoughtful, very insightful. And then, of course, we had the privilege of having a conversation to get ready for this, uh, this interview. So I want to begin, Roger, with asking you, why did you write the book? What motivated you to write the book? So imagine I began my career in technology in 1982 when the space program was actually the biggest thing going on. So right before the beginning of the personal computer industry as we know it. I spent 24 years in the industry helping to build all kinds of companies when technology was really about making the world better and empowering the people who used it. In 2006, I was asked to help a young entrepreneur solve a fundamental problem. That entrepreneur was Mark Zuckerberg. The company was Facebook. He was 22. Facebook was two years old. It was still just used by college students and high school students. There was no news feed, no business model. The ads that they had were just uh, banner ads for pizza delivery. <laughs> I was able to help Mark with that existential crisis in the business. We spent the following three years with me being a mentor, me being a mentee. Uh, the thing I was most proud of was bringing Sheryl Sandberg into Facebook. I was extraordinarily proud of Facebook, and it was one of those things where he had broken the code in a category of people had tried and failed at for 20 years, social media, because he required what, identity, and he gave people privacy control in the early days. In 2009, so before they even had the current business model, um, I did a handoff to other people whose skills were better suited to what Mark needed. And I just became a cheerleader. And then in 2016, after I had retired from the investment business, I began to notice over the course of that year, a series of massive uh, problems related to civil rights and related to uh, the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom and the Democratic primary uh, where bad actors were using Facebook's algorithms and its business model to harm innocent people. I reached out to Mark and Shell in the fall of 2016, in October, so nine days before the election, to share my fears and concerns with my friends, thinking they'd been the victim. They were dismissive. They viewed it as a public relations problem, not a business problem. They, they were polite and respectful. They handed me off to one of their colleagues who explained to me, Roger, we don't have a problem. The law says we're a platform, not a media company. So we're protected from anything anybody does. Then the election happened. It was very obvious because our intelligence agencies had told us so, that the Russians had interfered. I spent three months begging them to do what Johnson & Johnson did after somebody poisoned bottles of Tylenol which is you have to protect the people who use your product, even if the law says you're not responsible. They were in a trust business. I begged them for three months. They refused to do anything. And so I became an activist. I, in effect, did a 180 degree reversal, going from being one of their biggest cheerleaders to being an outspoken critic. I essentially turned my back on an entire professional career and all the relationships in it. I did it because that was my moment. If I wasn't willing to stand up and see, say what I saw was wrong in an industry that had been very kind to me, that had enriched me, in which I'd been a participant, in a company where I'd specifically played a role, then I wasn't going to stand up for anything. And I decided this was my moment, and I had to do it. And the problem was we got into this and we got Congress to have hearings and we wound up helping them do all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't enough. People knew there was a problem, but they didn't understand how it related to them. So I wrote a book called Zucked, and it is my journey. So you have to understand at the beginning of this thing, I'm like Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window. I mean, honest to God, I was a complete blithering idiot. I had in my enthusiasm and love for these people been blind to some signals that there were problems. Mm. So at the beginning, I just see something that looks like a crime scene. And the story is my journey of discovery. And I use it to tell the reader what they need to know. No technology gobbledygook, no nonsense. Just why at a policy level, why at an economic level, 
What's going on in Silicon Valley is not only wrong, it is harmful. It's hurting our public health. It's hurting our democracy. It's hurting our privacy. And I don't mean by privacy taking your credit card. I'm talking about your freedom to make choices without fear. And it is undermining the very foundations of capitalism and our economy. That is why I wrote the book. And in, in the book, you talk about the three quite important themes, that of trust, privilege, and power. Can you elaborate around each of those themes, yeah. please? So, so Facebook and Google, the thing to understand is I started by looking at Google at, at Facebook because that was the company I knew best. But in fact, Google is a greater threat to the economy, to our ability to make choices. Uh, Amazon is also a challenge, but across a narrower section of its business. And Microsoft is doing its best to become a problem as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder for them. They're in Seattle. It rains a lot. <laughs> so here, what we're looking at here is, in this country, we have had a fascination with youth and early achievement. And that has, over a period of 40 years, caused us to put technology in the hands of every younger children. And it's had a really material effect, most of it harmful. We wind up having these precocious people who are extraordinarily developed on a thing a millimeter wide, and they can go down to the bottom on that, but they know nothing else. They have no context and we put them on a pedestal, mm -hmm. and we give them all the advantages, right? They are uniformly white. They are almost uniformly male. They are uniformly extraordinary at a young age. They do not know the lessons of history. They do not know the lessons of comparative religion or political science or philosophy. And as a consequence, you wind up in this situation where you cannot have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Because if you are the founders of Google, you believe that your mission of making available all the world's information is so important that it justifies any means necessary to get there. And if you're Mark Zuckerberg, you believe that connecting everyone in the world is so important that it justifies 9,000 people killed in an ethnic cleansing in Myanmar or a poor man who was shot down on Facebook Live by people who did a joy kill. That these are just the cost of achieving this important thing. I'm sorry, that does not work for me. And my point is, I suspect if we have a conversation about this, that it won't work for a lot of you. You've already mentioned that you believe that fun, uh, Facebook undermines democracy, and you also mentioned it undermines capitalism. Can you please elaborate? Yeah, Thank so here, let's, the capitalism part I'm going to focus on yeah, because the, the democracy part becomes obvious once you right. understand the capitalism part. So if you studied the history of the uh, early, the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, the era of the robber barons, there were many things that they did that were brilliant. But much of that brilliance had a dark side. And I'll give you two specific examples. Before the robber barons, land was something passed. Well, it was stolen from the people who lived here and then passed from generation to generation by white people. It was not a commodity that was typically bought and sold. Work was something that people did, generally in some form of, of trade, for the goods that they needed. The robber barons converted land into real estate. They priced it. They made a market in it. They controlled that and got incredibly wealthy. They converted work into labor. They priced that. They controlled that market. They essentially took things that were in the public sphere and claimed ownership and control. And that is what's happening. Google invented this idea in 2002. They realized that, the, that when they were getting data from searches. They only needed about 1% of what they got in order to improve the quality of the search. The other 99% had no value for improving the search, but it was extraordinary because it gave them the ability to predict human behavior. Not necessarily for the person who gave it to them, but for everybody else. So they systematically went around to do everything they could to capture all the data in the environment. 
So they started with search, and they realized, well, we don't know who this person is, so we're going to create Gmail, and we're going to read every message so we can find out what they're thinking. But we don't know where they are, so we'll create Google Maps. We'll tie all these things together. And they go systematically. They get YouTube so they can find out what entertains people, right? And they capture all this data, and they create a behavioral prediction market. They go around, they create Street View, and they take pictures of everything. They do Google Maps, they take pictures from the sky. They cause to happen Pokemon Go, so they can do the same thing face to face. Are they doing this for your benefit? No. They're creating a redefinition of the market for which we do not have a vocabulary. And they have monopolized it. Now, Facebook's been able to grab a piece of it around their business. And Amazon, increasingly doing it as well. And the Microsoft trying to get in there. And the way it works is they make a behavioral prediction engine. And then they create products with artificial intelligence. They create filter bubbles in search, mm -hmm. or in Facebook's case, in Facebook and Instagram. And they create recommendation engines. And we think all these things are giving us what we want. But that's not actually what's happening. What's really happening is they're persuading us to buy what they want us to buy. And they're manipulating it. And you sit there and go, no, Roger, that's way too cynical. <laughs> and my response is, these are really, really, really smart people. Okay? And we don't have a vocabulary. And it's our job as a country to get up to speed. They, they are going, at, they're going after media. They've already destroyed journalism. They're going after other media now. They'll be in cars next, energy, healthcare, simple thing. Amazon, just gone into this healthcare initiative, doing a joint venture for health insurance. Have you, any of you guys ever seen that thing that Google has called Capture that's designed to figure out if you're a human being and you sit there and say, pick out the street signs or the cars, the buses? Here's the thing, you know what you're doing with those pictures? You're training. Google's artificial intelligence for automobiles. <laughs> this is a, they're inherently dishonest about all this stuff. They've figured out you're a human being from your mouse movement. So I want you to just roll it forward. It may be possible today, but it will be possible very soon for them to take a longitudinal study of your mouse movement and know the very first sign of a neurological problem. Let's say you develop Parkinson's. Now think about this for a minute. Who is their customer? Who is paying them? Is it you? No, you're getting everything for free. They're going to put it up to the highest bidder. Who do you think the highest bidder will be? Probably the insurance company that wants to take away your insurance or raise the price. My point to you here is that's not capitalism, folks. Right? That's something different. And we need to be aware of it. I wrote this book to get you started. An incredible woman at Harvard named Shoshana Zuboff did a 10-year study just put out a book that describes exactly how this works. It's big, but it's worth it. We can do this. I'm incredibly optimistic because we have an election coming in 2020. We're going to make this the issue. Why? Because this isn't about right versus left. It's about right versus wrong. Okay? And there's a lot more of us than there are of them. We're just going to follow the Teddy Roosevelt playbook. Okay? It's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> in, in your book, you talk a lot about AI, artificial intelligence, and you, you claim that it should be the digital penicillin of the 21st century, but it's not living up to this promise. It's Why not. is that? And here's the thing. Do you know how they train machine learning and artificial intelligence? They take data from the real world. And I suspect more than a few of you have run into the implicit biases of the real world, right? Specifically, the 51% of you who are women <coughs> and all the people of you who are not white men, okay? The world is full of implicit bias. And if you train an artificial intelligence only with the data of the real world, and then you apply it, say, to reviewing resumes for jobs, you're going to get a bias based on gender and based on race and maybe other factors. If you apply it to mortgages, what are you going to get? You're going to get redlining. 
if you apply it to facial recognition and the guys who did it are all white or Asian males, you're not gonna recognize women, that's Microsoft, or people of color, that's Google. My point to you here is you say, okay, well, they gotta get rid of the bias. Here's the problem. The powerful like the biases. If you're Google, you like having white and Asian males between 25 and 35 as your employees, and you would love to have an artificial intelligence that makes that seem legit. See, this thing has no bias. It's a computer. But that's not how it works. Technology always inherits the biases of the people who create it. And my point to you here is really simple. There is nothing inevitable about any of this stuff. I'm working in Congress. I'm working with the Trump administration. They understand there's a problem here. If we all make our voices heard, we're going to win this thing. Okay? I mean, it's just like what Bettina said. This is about showing up. Okay? And this is our moment for all of us. I'm willing to go out there and take the bullets, but if you wouldn't mind voting behind me, that would really help. <laughs> Let's switch gears a little bit and build on what you're saying as well. We, we know that Facebook's advertising model depends on engagement. Yeah. And when we look inside the messages, it seems to me that the messages that are favoured are those that play on the emotions of fear or anger yeah. over messages that are more neutral or positive. Could you please explain yeah. that to the audience? So here's the thing, and this is how incredibly stupid I felt. I, in 2016, I had been a professional analyst for 34 years in this sector. I'd invested in this company. And yet, because I had withdrawn from day-to-day -day activity in 2009, I wasn't actually aware of the mechanics of the business model. So here's the problem. If you're a Google, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, you need people to come back to your site a lot. How do you do that? You use tricks of psychology, the same ones that are used in slot machines. You give people rewards at uncertain times. You give them notifications. And you sit there as a human being think, wow, I just got a notification. So-and-so liked my post. And you probably don't think through the fact that they liked it four hours ago, but the AI has decided that you are most vulnerable right now. So it's going to send it to you right now because it wants to get you to come back. Or maybe you get likes and you want to go and see, hey, who liked my Instagram post? That's what gets you to come back. They want to build a habit. The problem is these things are so finely tuned that for most of us, habits turn into addiction. Quick test. When do you check your phone first thing in the morning? Is it before you pee or <laughs> while you're peeing? <laughs> <laughs> so we are all addicted to one degree or another. Then they get us inside this thing. And here's the thing. You think, well, just show me puppies and my grandchildren and, you know, fun stuff. Here's the problem. Somebody else's joy may, in fact, in me, induce a certain amount of jealousy. Oh my God, look at their vacation. Why can't I afford to do that? Right? But somebody says, I am terrified of whatever it is. And you go, oh my God, I'm terrified too. Now you both feel better because you're both terrified, right? <laughs> and the key thing is when you are afraid or you are outraged, you will share the thing that makes you afraid or outraged because... When we all feel that way, there's a herd thing where we all feel better, okay? Now, that's incredibly cynical because here's how it works in politics, right? When I was a kid, 1% of the population believed the earth was flat, right? Maybe three or 4% believed stuff that was demonstrably not true. <laughs> but if you feed somebody over and over again what they like, which is what Google and Facebook do, right? They, they basically give each one of us our own Truman Show, right? Our own facts. And what happens is they reinforce things that you're curious about. They get you into a group. Suddenly, your curiosity becomes a belief, and the belief gets more rigid and more extreme. That increases polarization. And what happens is because you see nothing and no opinions from anybody who disagrees with you, suddenly people who disagree are an enemy and weirdly, your facts are the only facts that matter. So today, at least 40% of Americans identify with at least one issue that is demonstrably false. One in three of us 
denies any relationship between human activity and climate change. I mean, look, <laughs> it's an, you, we can disagree about what to do about climate change, but disagreeing about the existence of it is nuts, right? I'm all for disagreeing about what you do, okay? Same thing with, with the connection between vaccinations and mm. autism. Mm. It's demonstrably not true. And yet, 7% of the population is convinced it's true. Now, that's 40%. How do you have a democracy if you can't agree on the facts? It's impossible. And there's no technology solution for that. We have to get together just like this, face to face. And here's a confession. A few years ago, I carried seven mobile devices on my belt. I looked like <laughs> I was a nerd's nerd. I mean, I was off the rails addicted to this stuff. And I'm not cured. Okay? I'm really not. I begin these meetings usually go, hi, I'm Roger. And everybody goes, hi, Roger. I'm an internet addict. Hi, Roger. Anyway, so, so the thing I would say to you here about, about this issue is that appeals to the weakest parts of human emotion are core to this business model. And then the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence to take the predictions about our behavior and steer us towards desired outcomes. That is where we are today. The thing with the mouse movement, I don't know if we're there today or we're gonna be there next year, but it's coming very, very soon. That is not the America I wanna live in. That's not the capitalism mm -hmm. I believe in, okay? And I think that, again, this is not right versus left. This is right versus wrong. On Tuesday, I'm going to get a chance to deliver a speech to the antitrust division of the Justice Department, the entire professional staff. Not because they agree with me, but because they think I might be right and they want to learn more. And at the same time, yesterday, Senator Elizabeth Warren came out with basically the Teddy Roosevelt playbook. I mean, it's demonstrably right. And what an interesting place for that to have started. That's not radical. That's American. It's actually Drucker. It's about noting that in the world, shareholders are not the only stakeholder whose point of view matters. Employees matter. The communities where you live matter. Your suppliers, your customers all matter and should all have a voice. I learned that from Drucker before I went to business school. And I'm sitting there going, that's the America I like. That's the capitalism I like. And we can get there again. We just need to remember we control the outcome. When we look at your background, we, you, and, and the introduction was quite uh, thorough, I thought, but you've been a successful investor. You've also been a leader of a rock band called Moon Alice. Your wife is a music theorist and songwriter, and you told me the first thing you said on the phone that you go to New Zealand a lot, so that we were off to a good start. <laughs> um, you, <laughs> you've found a way to blend together being an investor with your passion in arts and music. And at the Drucker School and at Claremont Graduate University, we embrace the same idea. We think that the best comes when students connect the arts with, with their professional area of study. And we look across disciplinary boundaries to try and solve some of the world's most complex problems. What I wish you, everyone would do that. Right? <laughs> I mean, you guys are the example of how it ought to happen. And, I, and I, related to that, you know, um, you know what, what do you think, in, you know, seeing your background that has allowed you to see this, this problem that you're working with now in a way that might be different to someone who's come up through a different education? So I was a history major. I was a French lit minor. I have played thousands of rock and roll shows. I've written hundreds of songs. I've now written two books. I've edited nine other. I read 40 to 50 novels a year. Now, that's not because I'm a better person than anyone else. That's merely the explanation for why I saw this. And it happens as a kid, and I tell the story of the book. I've had, I have been essentially all but dead four times in my life. I'm on my fifth life. And that's where the courage comes from. Okay? I live every day like it's the last one. And the point is, I owe all of you the mission that I'm on. Because Facebook wouldn't be where it is today. It would have been bought by Yahoo in 2006 if it weren't for me. And Cheryl would never have been there if it weren't for me. And so I have to do this. And my point is, it doesn't make me a better person. It just makes me the person I am. And that's all this is about. We just need to look and figure out who the, 
you know, who are we? What is our moment? What is our way? I mean, Bettina showed you what her way was this morning, right? And there are going to be some extraordinary people after this who show you their way. And all I ask is that each one of you just figure out what's your thing, right? It doesn't have to be mine. It can be whatever it is that's right for you. But I think we've gotten into this mode where we're all kind of passive and going along with it. And I'm going, why? I got to tell you, I was so isolated by technology. All my relationships were mediated by a screen. It was horrible. And part of what's happened here is that I'm suddenly interacting with people face to face again, making eye contact. I've gotten reconnected with my best friend from kindergarten. I hadn't seen him in 50 years. <laughs> and it turned out that his journey and mine were the same. It was like we picked up after 50 years. And we, I mean, what a tragedy we missed those 50 years. But what a blessing to be reconnected. And, you know, my thought is, relative to what I'm doing, each find your own way. But, but tr recognize that this technology isn't good for you, right? Alexa and Google Home, they're just there to spy on you, right? You sit there and go, look, it's convenient to have it give you a playlist or the weather, but oh my God, you understand what happens if they're in your bedroom, right? Do you understand what happens if they're in your office? You just have Jeff's promise that they're not gonna actually record every single thing you're doing. It is only a matter of time until some enterprising product manager breaks that rule. I do not use any Google products at all. I treat it like the game Frogger. I'm the frog. Google's the river. The other products are the logs. If you read the book, I explain to you exactly how to do it. I was rocking the other day. I was like five weeks into this great run of no Google. Some dude sends me a contact, come meet me here. And I don't pay enough attention. They use a URL shortener and I didn't realize it was a Google map. I'm back in the river, I gotta start again. My high score is two months, okay? If you can top it, let me know, okay? <laughs> you, you mentioned that you've read all of Peter Drucker's books long before you ever went into I MBA. I read them all, but well, I, read, I read a couple of the core ones yeah. because that's what you do, what you did in the industrial economy, right? Drucker was the, the only the voice author. that mattered. So if he were alive today, what do you think he'd be saying about social media platforms? You know, I don't, I don't want to pretend that I would know exactly, yeah, yeah. but I will tell you this, that my philosophy comes from that world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have no idea what an honor it is for me to be here today, because my worldview is formed by the management philosophies of Peter Drucker. And I'm talking 35, 40 years ago. And, you know, the fact that you guys are interested in what I'm working on, I mean, you know that yesterday, I was in Albany, New York. Tomorrow I'm in Austin, Texas, okay? Coming here was not an easy thing to do, but <laughs> I scheduled everything around this, right? Mm. Because this is where I want to be. So, so we're about to open up for questions, but I have one final question. Through, the, through, through your talk, you've talked about how we need to force change, and you're doing a lot uh, in politics now, trying to get the government to understand what needs to change. You also mentioned during your talk this morning about we the users have to also be in, uh, you know, take the lead and, and affect change. Yeah. So what do you think, what, what advice would you give us? What, what, what should we take control of? So for those of you who are parents, the most important thing is focus on children. We ran a 20-year experiment exposing kids from birth to screens. The notion being they have to get prepared for a life where technology dominates, so start early. That experiment, we now have enough data that pediatricians are going, whoops, <laughs> that was a mistake, okay? Little kids, again, I'm no expert on this, so I would refer you, and in my book, I tell you, I give you all the sources that I think are worth going to, and there are a lot more that are out there. But no screens to age two, almost no screens to age 14. Never have a computer in the classroom except for special needs kids. You want kids focused on the teacher. You want them learning to socialize with their classmates. And the book, Imagine at the beginning is this thriller. It's the narrative of my figuring out what the hell is going on. And then it finishes with three chapters. One of what you can do, one of what I think government needs to do, and then the last one is what I'm trying to do, okay? <laughs> and I would just say to you, this is a highly evolving thing. The book doesn't pretend to be definitive. What it's really about is preparing you with no techno babble, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just, it's for real people, not technologists. And I hope it'll be helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.
We now, good, push in time, good, thank you. Hi, my name is Cheryl Peterson. I'm a recent alum of uh, the Drucker School of Management. I did have um, the privilege of reading your book. Um, I, it, it was very compelling. Um, I have, am now using Facebook differently than I did before I read it, so thank you for that. Um, I do have a question, though, that's more on a personal, um, emotional level. Uh, we talk a lot, um, it came up in Bettina's about being mentors and mentees, and there was an emotional twinge in me when you realized that someone that you mentored had gone on the dark path. So for those of us that do mentor people, and we always talk about the successes, right? We talk about the people that have gone on to do great things. Yeah. And what does that feel like? And how, how did you, I mean, I, I've read the book, but how did you deal with that internally? So it is a great question. Mm -hmm. So it started with me writing an opinion piece for the Recode blog. And rather than publish it, I sent it to Mark and Cheryl because I'd mentored both of them. And what I realized was I didn't want this to be a public thing. I wanted to go to these friends of mine, these people I'd mentored, and have a private conversation. I did not expect them to accept what I said right away. They had gone through a seven year period at that point where essentially everything they did worked out and criticism was, in their mind, always wrong. And so I knew it was gonna be a slog. So I spent three months without breathing a word to anyone on the outside, trying to negotiate with them. It was when they literally didn't even move a millimeter that I finally concluded they weren't interested. And what really has bothered me about all of this is less what happened before I spoke to them. Because I think, as human beings, we're all gonna make mistakes. And so I do, you know, their mistakes have more impact because of their global scale. Same with Google, right? And, but they're still human beings and they're allowed to make mistakes. What drives me insane about Google, Facebook, uh, and now Amazon and Microsoft is that they refuse to accept responsibility even after all the evidence is clear. And that is so painful. And so I have not communicated with Mark or Cheryl since the 30th of October of 2016. No one from Facebook has been willing to talk to me since February of 2017. So they've just completely aced me out. Three weeks ago, Bill Gates, somebody I knew really well, I helped him with his first book. I managed money for him. I was you know, not socially close to him, but, but professionally very close to him since we were Cubs, okay? He said something unbelievably uh, unkind in a public setting that got pretty wide press coverage. And that hurt too, but you know what? This is important and you just gotta be prepared not to be popular. And I will admit, every time I go in the grocery store, I'm prepared for somebody coming up to me and you know, shaking me down. And it's uncomfortable, but you know what? <sighs> I deserve it because I profited from this. I was part of it. And I, I think it's important for me to be man enough to stand up for, for the issues. I mean, there's people in this country who've been abused having never gotten any benefit at all, right? Like all women, all people of color. I mean, you know, so about time a white guy got some that <laughs> <laughs> work, okay. Uh, Roger, first of all, thank you for being so brave and having the courage to take on this catastrophe in uh, social media. I, I agree with you. I think it's a huge problem. Uh, Pat Soldano, I work a lot with legislators in Washington, D.C. So my question to you is, uh, as we all know, the country's become so polarized, right and left, extreme right, extreme left. Do you think this is an issue that our legislators could actually get together and solve? And if so, how do you see them solving it? This is a really great question. <laughs> So when this project began, I didn't know anybody in Washington at all. And at the beginning, I thought that, the, Tristan and I both thought that the problems were a combination of public health and democracy. And the problem was that the democracy element appeared to be partisan, right? Even though it wasn't. I mean, when I reached out to Mark and Cheryl, the election hadn't even happened, right? I wasn't, it never even occurred to me it was gonna affect the results of the general election. So one of the problems we had was for 2017 and the first half of 2018, we were only able to talk to Democrats except in one issue, which was antitrust, where Senator Orrin Hatch embraced the ideas and 
guided me through a whole bunch of stuff and for which I will always be incredibly grateful. Um, more recently, the folks at the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department have also been incredibly supportive of at least the intellectual journey that I'm on. We don't yet have both sides of Congress on this. What we have, though, is really great leadership uh, on antitrust on the Democratic side and absolute um, enthusiasm from some members on the Republican side, particularly in the Senate. Senator Josh Hawley from uh, Missouri, for example, has stood up. And Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee has, has indicated some interest in this. And it's a beginning, right? The key thing I want to do is have it be such a big issue in the 2020 election cycle that everybody realizes that this is a place they can all safely go, right? On both sides. I've done seven appearances on Fox since the book launched. I've done only uh, three on M MSNBC. And I've worked really hard to make this a nonpartisan issue because, you know, my personal politics have nothing to do with this. This is about capitalism, this is about democracy, this is about public health, this is about our freedom to make choices. And it's about being an American. And so mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to keep at this. So film at 11, we'll see what happens, okay? I don't, I don't want to pretend like we got this in the bag. I need your help. I need you to talk to your elected representatives and just tell them this really matters. We've got what, time for one more question. And by the way, I'll also be signing books mm. at lunch. So if you have other questions, just come up and ask them, okay? I'll be there. Yes, good morning, Roger. My name is Jesse James Morales. I'm a retired bank executive. Um, and my question to you that I didn't hear you address is based on the conversation I had this morning with my son in New York. Uh, my son is a senior executive with Microsoft. Uh, he's in the education platform of Microsoft. He heads it. Um, and uh, he was asking me some questions in relation to history. Uh, recently, uh, Dr. Gates, Lewis Gates, has been doing this Finding Your Roots and the Ancestry.com and history yeah. of your ancestors and stuff. And uh, my son was talking about something to do with law. Uh, he's, they're making a presentation at NYU. Uh, as a sidelight, uh, he teaches uh, data analytics. And you were talking about artificial intelligence. Many years ago when, when I was uh, a bank executive, I'm a retired bank right. president, CEO. Maybe the question to you that I have is, I, you're preaching to the choir. Everyone here has become reliant on these social media. I didn't grow up with that. I, I, I'm a product of, uh, first of all, I was a Marine for, for some years. And I'm an Agent Orange survivor. Um, what bothers me is the hypocrisy and the irony of the fact that, yes, I see the danger, and I've been talking to my son and my grandsons and my great-grandsons about the fact that this is so wrong, that they should read books. I'm a, I'm a reader. Yeah. What can you tell us about the dangers of data analytics? So the issue isn't the data analytics per se. It's what we're applying it to, right? The issue of all this stuff, it, the problem isn't machine learning. The problem isn't AI. It's not data analytics. It's, it's this notion that, that we're going to treat data as the new oil, and we're going to treat people as the oil well, and we're going to extract value from them without giving anything in return. And we're gonna do that because there, we operate today with essentially no rules in this area, at least in the United States, and we operate without any uh, constraints, right? Government for 50 years knew that it could trust technology to make products that empowered us. So we weren't ready for that. Beginning in November of 2017, the flag went up. We're beginning to recognize what we have to do. And I just want to finish with one thought. All problems create a business opportunity. I believe that this will create the business, biggest business opportunity of our lives, that what we will create out of it will be better for our economy, better for the people who create these industries than what we have today, which is really saying something. And 
It's all about what Steve Jobs used to talk about, which is technology that empowers us. He called it bicycles for the mind. Let's get back to a distributed model of computing. Let's reinvent an internet so that it empowers everybody. Let's apply these skills of machine learning, data analytics, and artificial intelligence to making each and every one of us happier, healthier, smarter, wealthier. I think we can do that. And that's my mission. And I hope you will all join me. And I hope if we're acquired that we'll sing a beautiful song together. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.